For today's lecture, we're going to be focusing on the development of muscle, in particular skeletal muscle, and nerve, both nerve derived from the neural tube as well as nerve and other derivatives derived from neural crest. As we look at this image from Dr. Kathy Sulik's website of scanning electron microscopy, we can see the ectoderm, which we're outlining here, the endoderm. We can identify the neural tube underneath it, the notochord. And on either side of the neural tube, we can identify the cell mites. There are some tissue up in this area, some cells, which are going to become cells that we're going to call neural crest. These are the cells we're going to be talking about during the lecture today. One of the factors that's influential in the development of nerve, in particular, is bone morphogenetic protein and fibroblast growth factor. In the midline, the ectoderm sees an increase in the transcription factor fibroblast growth factor and a decrease in the levels of bone morphogenetic protein. The bone morphogenetic protein forms a gradient with its highest levels out in the lateral ectoderm. Now fibroblast growth factor is going to induce other factors like noggin and cordon and it is noggin and cordon which are going to help to inhibit the levels of bone morphogenetic protein in this midline ectoderm. So that if this ectoderm is protected from bone morphogenetic protein, it will begin to express and differentiate into nervous tissue. You remember that the neural plate then was derived from ectoderm and during lateral body folding and neurulation we had an involution of this ectoderm that was above the notochord and that this neural tube tissue neural fold tissue became a neural tube and came to lie under the ectoderm so that at the end of development, uh, the end of lateral body folding, we would have an ectoderm surrounding the embryo. We would have a neural tube, a notochord, and on either side of the neural tube, somites. In between the somites, or paraaxial mesoderm, and the neural tube, we would find neural crest cells, not depicted in this image. This just reminds us how the neural tube formed as there was fusion in the midline of the lateral plate mesoderm, excuse me, the lateral edges of the neural tube, and that these continued all the way up this fusion up to the anterior neural pore and the posterior neural pore. These eventually fused, and we ended up with a neural tube. The neural tube, if we look at it in this very simple cartoon, is going to be made up of a central canal and then a group of neuroepithelial cells that surround it. At the lateral boundaries of the central canal, we see that there is a little bit of an outpocketing, and this is called sulcus limitans. That's going to be an important landmark as it helps divide the neural tube into a sensory portion more dorsally and a motor portion ventrally. The notochord would sit down here where you see neural tube. When we look a little closer at the neuroepithelium, the lumen of the central canal would be here. What you can see is a population of dividing neuroepithelial cells 
and those cells are going to begin migrating towards an external limiting membrane or the basement membrane of the neural tube. And so we'll see waves of these cells which are going to start migrating outwardly from the central canal. The neuroepithelial cells are going to take on several different characteristics depending on how they differentiate. One group of neuroepithelial cells will become first bipolar neuroblasts and then uh, different types of neuroblasts including multipolar neuroblasts. Other neuroepithelial cells will differentiate into glioblasts and these glioblasts will form the supporting structures in the neural tube, things like protoplasmic and fibrillar astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and ependymal cells which align the central canal. There will be also mesenchymal cells migrating inward to give rise to some of the other microglia, the supportive cells found in the central nervous system. This then shows what happens as the neural blasts from the central canal, the surround the central canal, that is that neuroepithelial la layer of cells, begins to differentiate and move outward into the developing central nervous system. Sulcus limitans is at the tip of the arrow on either side and what you're going to see is a group of neurons associated with sensory information developing dorsally in a region that we call the alar plate. Another group of neurons is going to develop ventrally in a region we call the basal plate. Both the alar plate, the basal plate, and this intermediate region is called the mantle layer. It is a cellular layer of the developing central nervous system. So we have a neuroepithelial layer, a mantle layer, and then the cells of these mantle layer are going to give rise to processes which are going to ascend and descend the spinal cord and brain. And these ascending and descending axons are going to come to lie in this region which is called the marginal layer of the spinal cord. The mantle layer will become the gray matter and the marginal layer will become the white matter. Another important structure that we're seeing here on either side of the spinal cord or central nervous system are groups of cells called neural crest cells. These are derived from ectoderm and they're going to go on to form many different cell types. One cell type depicted here is the sensory neurons. So here we can see the neuroepithelial cells giving rise to an alar plate and a basal plate also giving rise to this marginal layer. And we can see the neural crest cells giving rise to dorsal root ganglion cells. These are pseudo-unipolar neurons. These are sensory neurons. Their central processes will go in and synapse in regions of either the alar plate or some will ascend. In the bottom photograph what we can see is a spinal cord here we can begin to see some of the motor axons which arise from cells in the basal plate and we can also see some of the developing somites out in this region here. These will give rise to muscle cells and in addition to some of the regions of the dermis. One of the points that we made was that if there are low levels of bone motor genetic protein, the neural tube is going to form. Out at higher levels of bone morphogenetic protein, the nervous tissue will not form. The ectoderm will develop into the skin. In 
the intermediate levels, there is an intermediate level of bone morphogenetic protein which will induce cells to become neural crest cells, which you'll see are coming off the ectoderm here. So the intermediate levels of bone morphogenetic protein under the influence of both fibroblast growth factor and WNT are going to cause an increase in PAX3. This increase in PAX3 as well as the presence of FOXD3 is going to help drive those cells in that intermediate region in between the neural tube and the ectoderm to become neural crest cells. Now these neural crest cells are going to migrate and part of their migration is a result of the expression of slug. What I would hope you're going to begin to see here is there is a cascade of factors which are going to influence the first of all formation of neural crest cells and then the migration, proliferation, and differentiation of these neural crest cells into many different cell types. When we talk about neural crest, we can talk about the fact that there are many different regulatory factors involved. There are lots of different regulatory factors involved and they vary by species as well. And what I want to present to you here is just a brief overview so you get an, an appreciation of the complexity of neural crest differentiation. The induction of neural crest, as we said, is dependent on levels of bone morphogenetic protein, fibroblast growth factor, and the WNT gene. Now, once neural plate border, that region between the neural plate and the ectoderm is identified, it's, spe it's specified by the uh, expression of PAX3 in particular and ZIC. Once it's been specified, then this neural crest specification will continue to develop under the influence of things like SNAIL, FOXD3, CMIX, and SOX9. And we're going to talk quite a bit about the SOX genes as being very important in the next stage of development. But we not only have to have specification, but we have to allow these neural crest cells to keep proliferating. And that's under the influence of things like ID and MYC. In addition, there's a delamination and migration of the neural crest cells such that as they come off that region between the ectoderm and the neural plate, that they begin to migrate appropriately and so we're going to be talking about things like cadherins and integrins and SOX10. Finally, the differentiation of these cells into their specific cell types, that is the differentiation of neural crest into its multiple cell types, is going to be under the influence of SOX9 or 10 and FOXD3. So if we look at this in a little further detail, we can see a chart like this. And this is rather complicated, but, rather, but it is meant to show you how neural crest cells can go on to form many different cell types. And we'll deal with this bottom row first. So we're dealing with the formation of cartilage and bone in the head region, pigment cells throughout the body, melanocytes, the neural crest is going to give rise to the sensory neurons, to autonomic, sympathetic, and parasympathetic neurons, to the autonomic enteric nervous system, which we'll talk about. That is the nervous system along the GI tract, to Schwann cells, so that the neural crests are going to give rise to the Schwann cells, which are going to surround the ventral root cells found uh, coming from the basal plate of the neural tube. In addition, neural crest cells give rise to cells that form the cardiac septum. They also form the chromaffin cells found in the medulla of the adrenal and connective tissue cells. So how does this get directed? What we can begin to see 
is there is a differential expression of different genes so that we get SOX9 genes uh, are going to then allow for a regulatory network to form that gives rise to cartilage and bone and this cascade of regulatory gene expression is going to be different for cartilage and bone than it is for say the melanocytes. Here now it's a combination of SOX9 and 10 that is expressed which then gives rise to its own cascade that helps the guide the differentiation of the melanocytes. You can see that in terms of the development of neurons now it's mostly SOX10 is important and that begins another cascade but notice how these cascades and neural networks, neural crest regulatory networks change depending on whether sensory neurons are going to be formed, autonomic neurons are going to be formed, or enteric nervous system neurons are going to be formed. And you can see that different genes get expressed, different regulatory factors are expressed that allow for the differentiation of these different cell types. For example, here we can see that we can develop Schwann cells. Schwann cells envelop the cells of the peripheral nervous system, sensory and motor neurons. So how do these Schwann cells develop? First of all, they're influenced by SOX10, which then turns on some of these regulatory uh, genes, protein zero, myelin basic protein, and connexins. In addition, neuroglin uh, and endothelia and the thelion 3 also get turned on, which then helps guide the neural crest cells to become Schwann cells. SOX9 is important in terms of the development of the cardiac septum, and SOX8 and 10 are important in the development of chromosphin cells. So you can see that there is a vast regulatory network, and this is only really a small portion of it that helps drive these neural crest cells to the termination, their terminal differentiation into all these different cell types. So you can see this is where neural crest begins at the junction of the neural fold and the ectoderm. And these neural crest cells then are going to migrate and delaminate off that region and are going to migrate into many different regions. They'll differentiate in the preaortic ganglia, the medulla of the suprarenal gland, the enteric ganglia around the GI tube, the sympathetic ganglia, the dorsal root ganglia, into Schwann cells. And so we have multiple cell types that have to migrate in the appropriate direction and then differentiate appropriately to give rise to these different cell types. And so what we're going to have then is the development from the basal plate of the neural tube, both the general somatic efferent and general visceral efferent neurons. As they go out past the spinal nerve into the ventral and dorsal rami, those neurons are going to be enveloped by Schwann cells. The Schwann cells are derived from neural crest. In addition, you can see that some of these uh, general visceral efferent cells are going to enter the sympathetic chain and then synapse with postganglionic general visceral efferent cells and those postganglionic cells are developed from neural crest. You can also see that the dorsal root ganglion cells develop from neural crest and they have peripheral processes which once again must be surrounded by Schwann cells again from neural crest origin. These dorsal root ganglion cells are going to synapse in the Ehler plate. So when we look at neural crest derivatives, you can see that there are a myriad number of cells that develop 
and tissues, the connective tissue and bones of the face and skull. We'll talk about that much later. Cranial nerve ganglia, cells of the thyroid gland, the conal truncal septum uh, in the outflow tract of the heart, odontoblasts, the dermis in the face and the neck, the spinal or dorsal root ganglia, sympathetic chain ganglia and the preaortic ganglia, the parasympathetic ganglia along the GI tract, Cells of the adrenal medulla, those chromaffin cells, Schwann cells, glial cells, melanocytes, and some of the smooth muscle cells in the blood vessels of the face and the forebrain. All of these are cell types that came from the original neural crest cells. Now you may wonder what's important about all this, but one of the things that we think about is infectious agents or other agents that can cause neural defects. So if we step back a second we can look at viruses for example uh, and other uh, infectious agents that can cause things like microcephaly, blindness, mental retardation, or hydrocephalus. Um, and these can be caused by a variety of factors. Here you see an infant with hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus is when that central canal becomes blocked in the region of the brain. We have a buildup of cerebral spinal fluid and that increase in cerebral spinal fluid causes the ventricles to increase and the head to enlarge. This is an example of microcephaly. Uh, and microcephaly can be caused, for example, by uh, alcohol, fetal alcohol syndrome. Uh, X-rays can cause the microcephaly and hypothermia can cause things like anencephaly, spina bifida, and mental retardation. So hypothermia can be a problem and that's why you'll tell your patients not to get into the saunas or the hot tubs when they're pregnant. Other uh, chemical agents can cause different types of problem and one of the most common chemicals is, thing, is, some, is alcohol. Alcohol can cause fetal alcohol syndrome and this is the leading cause of mental retardation. Fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder occurs in one in a hundred live births. In addition there are other causes of neural defects, things like maternal diabetes can cause neural tube defects and cardiac defects. Obesity, maternal obesity can also cause neural tube defects. And we could really look at this and tie this back to some of the other factors we were talking about. There's a postulated effect of diabetes on neural crest cells. And what is suspected is that with elevated glucose level, instead of PAX3 increasing, which it does with normal glucose levels of the mother, the PAX3 levels decline. With the PAX3 levels declining, then the P53 protein increases rather than decreases. And what P53 does is P53 causes the neural crest cells and the neuroepithelium to arrest and to become apopto apoptotic. That is, the cells undergo apoptosis. So they undergo programmed cell death. With the programmed cell death, the neural crest cells are not present as they would be normally under normal glucose levels. And what would that do? One of the things that, that would do without the neural crest cells and with the neural epithelium uh, arrested, the outflow tract of the heart is susceptible to outflow tract defects and the neural tube is also then subject to neural tube defects and to not fuse. These levels then occur very early on and when we're talking about maternal diabetes both type 1 and type 2 we're not talking about gestational diabetes which occurs much later in uh, pregnancy. We're talking about a diabetic mother whose glucose levels are not appropriately controlled. 
Going back to fetal alcohol syndrome, uh, it's the leading cause of preventable mental retardation. It affects about 40,000 newborns a year. Um, and the, uh, some of the f fetal alcohol spectrum disorders uh, are more common than autism, for example. And these can last a lifetime. And they're 100% preventable if you can keep patients from overdoing it and drinking alcohol. So one has to assume then that no amount of alcohol uh, during pregnancy is safe uh, and that while FASDs are not caused intentionally by the mother, um, these uh, can occur when women simply don't know that they're pregnant. And it is the early use of, of alcohol that can cause some of these disorders. So that um, it's important that we talk about pre-conception uh, health and that we encourage uh, women who want to get pregnant to avoid alcohol because alcohol is a teratogen and will interfere with the development of the fetus. Now we can turn to the development of muscle and I want to focus mostly on skeletal muscle here and again talk about a cascade of effects in the region of the somite that leads to the formation of skeletal muscles. Again you can look at the neural tube and the notochord and the somite and we'll talk about the different regions of the somite and how it is the dermomyotome that forms and the sclerotome and then the dermomyotome forms the dermatome and at either end a myotome that gives rise to the skeletal muscle cells. So the paraaxial mesoderm on either side of the neural tube is going to give rise to the somite. It is that paraaxial membrane uh, mesoderm that gives rise to skeletal muscle. Here in this illustration by Langman we can see the somite then breaking up into a sclerotome and into a dermatome and these dorsal medial or ventral lateral myotomes, these muscle cells which are going to develop. And here you can see that myotome beginning to form uh, in between the dermatome and the sclerotome. You can see that there are occipital somites as well as the cervical, thoracic myotomes, lumbar, and sacral. We also have pharyngeal arch musculature and eye muscle uh, muscles which have a little bit different uh, cascade of events that lead to their differentiation. So we can talk about how do we form skeletal muscle cells out of these mesenchymal cells found in the somite. The paraxial mesoderm gives rise to the somites and there are 42 to 44 of them. Here you can see the somites listed and in the somite there's a myotome and the myotomes develop into muscles. As we said, the somite can be divided into a dermatome, a myotome, and a sclerotome. And here we're looking at the sclerotome, lateral to the neural tube. There's the notochord. And we can identify the hypaxial and epaxial regions of the dermal myotome. And we can make the point that there's a cascade that occurs of growth factors that uh, of factors, of, excuse me, of genes that are expressed that can help direct what the muscle, which of these cells becomes muscle cells. So at first there's the expression of PAX3. PAX3 then is especially prevalent in the hypaxial muscles. In addition, the PAX3 and PAX7 uh, are going to be expressed as the later parts of the program uh, begin to occur. So the early myotome is on the influence of PAX3, MYF5, and the embryonic trunk musculature 
is again under the influence of PAX3, as is the embryonic limb musculature. So let's look at this in a little more detail. What we can see are there's multi-potential stem cells in the somite. And what's going to happen is under different influences, these cells can become bone, cartilage, there's dermis, fat, endothelium, smooth muscle, or skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle cells develop under the influence of PAX3 and 7. Also under the influence of notch. As they become committed to become muscle cells or the muscle stem cell, they then come under the influence of fibroblast growth factor or myostatin and become determined myogenetic progenitors. These cells then begin to express things like MYF5 or MyoD and when they do they become a myofiber. In a little more detail what we're saying is that PAX3 and PAX7 cause the these cells of the trunk and the limb that are located in the somite to identify themselves as muscle progenitors and then these cells become determined with the expression of MYF5 or MYOD and then they will begin to differentiate under the influence of myogenin or MYOD MRF4. Now notice the other skeletal muscle cells will differentiate under the influence of the same set of genes. And also, they will become determined by the same set of genes. But here now, the branchial arch muscles have a little different influence in terms of recruiting these muscle progenitors. So in the branchial arch musculature and the extraocular muscles, it's PTX2 that's important. And then the expression of MYF5 and even MRF4 in the, re in the eye muscles to cause a determination of these cells. Then the expression of MyoD and differentiated cells expressing myogenin. So while we have skeletal muscle cells in different regions and the progenitors are influenced differently. You see that the cell, skeletal muscle cells themselves as they differentiate will express the same set of genes. This is just to show you that it varies in vertebrates, Drosophila, and C. elegans and we can talk about this. I don't want to spend much more time but I do want to just talk about the fact that there are external signals that play a role in then the specification of cells into PAX3 and then uh, with PAX3 expression we begin to get things like MYF5 and MRF4 that then influence the hypaxial and epipaxial mesoderm to express MyoD and once that happens these cells can begin to differentiate. This is a little bit different in the other cell types but it's the same uh, sort of network that's formed uh, of gene expression that directs cells from uh, stem cells on through to becoming differentiated skeletal uh, muscle cells. So if we look at the differentiation of skeletal muscle, we can see we go from myoblasts to myocytes to myotubes. And then those myotubes are going to fuse into these multinucleated, long, striated muscle cells. And this is directed then by this uh, gene network. That again, in another view, we can see that these cells from the somite first are going to come under the influence of PAX3, which allows them to delaminate and begin migrating under the influence of 
uh, things like CMET, HGF, LBX1. Again, the PAX3 is going to maintain that stem cell population with things like PAX3. And then as those stem cells begin to be determined, the determined cells are going to begin expressing things like MYF5 and MyOD. And these are transcription factors then, which will call for the, exp the uh, differentiation of these cells by the expression of specific muscle uh, cell genes like MyoD, MRF4, MEF2. And so you'll get the then formation of specific muscles. So we can then compare and contrast how the cells of the uh, myotome are going to be different uh, under different influences from the cells of the sclerotome and how the sclerotome is under the influence of PAX1 whereas as we said these cells it's it, under different influence and eventually uh, the WENT genes are important for the expression of MYF5 and MyOD and they're turning the, the stem cells into muscle cells. We can talk about hypaxial muscles innervated by dorsal rami or uh, excuse me, epaxial muscles innervated by dorsal rami and hypaxial muscles innervated by ventral rami. That's one way to discuss skeletal muscles. That the, then the muscles will become the deep muscles of the back, the epaxial and the hypaxial muscles become things like intercostals, abdominal muscles, etc. Or another way that people are talking about these now is the primaxial and abaxial muscles. And we can talk about then certain muscles of the upper limb and in the thoracal abdominal region as coming from primaxial regions and abaxial regions give rise to a different set of muscles including all of the lower limb muscles. So we can think about different uh, origins of the abaxial and primaxial muscles. In terms of smooth muscle, I uh, just briefly want to touch it. We'll be talking about it more later, but smooth muscle comes from lateral plate mesoderm. Uh, the gut smooth muscle comes from splanchnic mesoderm and the coronary arteries, uh, the precursors of those are in the epicardium. Uh, as we said, the, we can talk about the uh, muscles of the eye, we, can, we talked a little bit about the voluntary muscles, but things like the sphincter and dilator muscles of the pupil are derived from the ectoderm. A smooth muscle associated with the mammary gland and the sweat glands also are derived from ectoderm. When we talk about smooth muscle, we can see a little different uh, pathway. And again, seeing the WNT uh, signaling regulates the development of smooth muscle precursors. So smooth muscle is going to develop in a little different way than skeletal muscle. Uh, there is binding to a card box here and this motif that's found in smooth muscle cells then s uh, allows for the transcription of smooth muscle uh, proteins like alpha actinin, myosin, uh, tropomyosin, etc. So uh, a little different uh, transcriptional regulation of uh, the smooth muscle genes. And cardiac muscle will develop uh, again in a different way and uh, we can talk about this in the next section. But hopefully you'll get an appreciation of the complex series of events that takes place as these different cell types, muscle cells and nerve cells develop.